settler colonialism invariably leads to some attempt at genocide. Um, that was the case in the United States, in Canada, in Australia. It wasn't the case in New Zealand because the Maoris were too tough. Uh, it wasn't the case in South Africa because the Zulus and other South African blacks were too tough. It wasn't the case in Kenya because eventually black Kenyans rose up in the Mau Mau movement, which was, uh, which was itself a horror. Um, but it did result in uh, a separation from uh, the colonial rule of the British. Same thing could happen. Now, um, the, uh, the the difficulty of all this is, is obvious in terms of the fact that you've got a, an Israeli cabinet, which is the most determined genocidal cabinet the world has ever seen. Um, and I don't excuse the Nazi cabinets uh, from that comparison. Um, the overt statements of genocidal intent are uh, unmistakable. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I have the great privilege of talking again to Ambassador Chas Freeman, who, among other posts in Asia and Africa, was U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 1992-92, and then became Assistant Secretary of Defense from 93 to 94. He is intimately familiar with the Middle East, uh, but also with China and with Europe, um, and he makes a point of actually calling the Middle East the, uh, West Asia. And this is the main part of the first part that we want to talk about today, about the Israel-Palestine tragedy that's going on at the moment, and then geopolitics um, more generally uh, later. Ambassador Freeman, thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure, Pascal. Ambassador, before I prompt you with any concrete questions, how do you interpret what is currently going on in Palestine, Israel, and in Gaza and the West Bank, um, what do you think one needs to understand about the current situation? Well, I think um, it's very clear what Israel wants. Uh, it's made no secret that it wants to depopulate Gaza um, by whatever means it can, um, uh, by uh, starving people into leaving, uh, by expelling them, or by killing them all. Uh, and it is no, there's no question that it meets the definition of genocide. Uh, they have the intent to destroy an entire people. Uh, they have the ability and they are in fact carrying out an operation intended to do so. Uh, so that is very clear. I think it's also quite clear why Hamas did what it did. Uh, that is, this was in the nature of a jailbreak uh, from the world's largest concentration camp. Uh, the men who came out of Gaza in some 15 different locations uh, had a firm grasp of what they were, what their mission was. It was a military raid uh, into uh, military installations, including kibbutzim uh, settlements uh, with a military function uh, and usually staffed by regular soldiers from the Israeli Defense Force. Those soldiers had, in fact, been removed by Mr. Netanyahu um, to protect settlers as they expanded their eviction of Palestinians on the West Bank. So the kibbutzim were not well defended, uh, but they were defended. Um, when the Hamas people came out of Gaza, others, other groups followed them and a lot of civilians. And having been treated like animals, they behaved like animals. And what they did in terms of uh, the horrors they visited on uh, the inhabitants of the kibbutzim were, were truly horrible, was truly horrible, uh, inexcusable. Um, it re reminds Americans of our own history of slave revolts, in which slaves, for example, the f most famous one being Nat Turner, uh, slaves uh, revolted and killed all the whites that they could find. And there was, of course, no excuse for those murders, and they were morally and uh, legally uh, inexcusable, uh, but they were understandable, given the manner in which uh, those who were leading the revolt had been treated. And I think the same thing is true uh, with the Palestinians in Gaza. Um, 
what they did was horrifying. It was inexcusable, but it was understandable. The Israeli reaction has been vastly disproportionate. And that is Israel's custom. Uh, it tries to react disproportionately in order to intimidate and to deter anyone from attacking it. And um, so that is not new. But what is new is the genocidal statements uh, and the and the proposed uh, emptying of Gaza that I have referred to. Some of the former settlers, Israeli settlers in Gaza, uh, vow have vowed to come back. Uh, they will find themselves in a wasteland. Uh, Sixty percent of the buildings in northern Gaza have been destroyed. And we know that something over 12,000 uh, Palestinians have been murdered by one means or another. Uh, Israel has destroyed most of the hospitals in Gaza. It now seems to be working on the schools. So it is totally ruthless. And the whole thing is particularly macabre because it is such a vivid reminder of the Warsaw Ghetto, a very parallel situation in which uh, driven beyond uh, any ability to tolerate what was being done to them, the Jewish inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto rose against Nazi Germany, and the Nazis exterminated them all and leveled, leveled the ghetto. Uh, one would think that the survivors of that Holocaust and the larger Holocaust in Europe uh, would not wish to re repeat a Holocaust against another people, but evidently that is expecting too much of human nature. Um, so we have a case of a breakout from a concentration camp, uh, dreadful things being done to anyone who was in the way of that. And by the way, um, it now appears that the much of the killing at the rave, meaning the music festival that uh, was going on, uh, ironically, right next to Gaza, where music festivals are not a common occurrence, uh, that much of the killing there was actually done by Israeli forces who fired indiscriminately at both the Hamas uh, warriors and the and the uh, and the, the milling crowds at the festival. Similarly, some of the major damage in the kibbutzim and the murders of the settlers there were done uh, not by Hamas, but by Israeli forces firing uh, tank bullets into houses and the like, and uh, hellfire missiles into cars and so forth. So this was a dreadful beginning to what has turned out to be an absolutely nauseating uh, month and a half of, 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 of slaughter. Not finished. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the world stands by. Uh, the United States has the ability to stop this by uh, halting arms supplies to Israel, but does not do that. Opposes a ceasefire in support of Mr. Netanyahu's uh, revenge against uh, the Palestinians. And Mr. Netanyahu, I would remind you, is on record many years ago as expressing hope for a war in which Israel could expel all the Arabs in its midst and seems to be taking advantage of this uh, to do that, hoping, I suppose, that his reputation, which has been greatly damaged by charges of corruption and by his suspension of judicial independence in Israel, can somehow be redeemed by this uh, act of revenge. Uh, so. Uh, where we are is uh, is a very bad place. I note also there are parallels uh, in terms of the unwillingness of the West to act forcefully against South African apartheid. Um, and uh, having been intimately involved in the negotiations with South Africa, Cuba, and Angola that began to catalyze um, the end of apartheid, I can tell you uh, that the decisive move there uh, was the suspension of refinancing of South African debt by Swiss banks. Uh, so uh, Israel has been forced to borrow $6 billion internationally, apparently at quite high interest rates. Uh, 
because of a perceived political risk, um, if someone doesn't stop the weapons supply to Israel one way or another, it may be that the bankers uh, will pull the plug on uh, on this war, which they also have the capability to do. So I've said a lot, um, and I will stop here. Thank you for this overview. My, my next question is, what do you make of this um, narrative? A, in the in the Western media, because I remember that when we spoke a year ago, you were saying that the narrative control currently uh, exerted on mainstream media is is as bad as never before. You likened it at the time to uh, McCarthyism of this this relentless anti-Russian uh, sentiment that was that was that was um, especially prevalent like a year a year and a half ago. And now we have this narrative in the in the Western media. If you read the New York Times, they always start with a uh, thousand two hundred Israelis that were killed. Very passionate, uh, describe that, and then only in the later paragraphs, very dispassionately go into the twelve thousand killed Palestinians, which is basically the fault of Hamas because human shields and so on. Uh, that on the one hand, and then there's this other thing that that I that I noticed in mainstream media, but also here online, everybody is. Uh, interpreting Hamas's deeds as a way of sabotaging uh, Saudi Israel uh, rapprochement and US, the US uh, pushing for that for a great deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Do you share that assessment or do you see it differently? Well, you've really asked two questions. One is uh, what about the media? Um, and I think um, the mainstream media continue to be very pro-Israeli and to report uh, narratives uh, manufactured in Israel. But I note that more recently, many of them have become quite skeptical because uh, what Israel is reporting is extraordinarily crude propaganda, some of it obviously utterly false. Um, and they've been caught out in this. And uh, even some of the mainstream media are beginning to report that um, they're lying uh, about a huge number of things uh, that is, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, but I think the more important development is perhaps related to age uh, and um, younger people, generally in the West, certainly in my own country, the United States, are far more inclined uh, to be sympathetic to the Palestinians than they ever were before. It's not that they dislike Israelis, uh, but now confronted with, with graphic images of horrors uh, the murder of, of, of as you said, 12,000 some people, uh, they're not dispassionate. Uh, not only are they demonstrating in all of the world's capitals uh, for a ceasefire, which their governments decline to support for the most part, uh, but uh, social media is now overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian as opposed to pro-Israeli. So I think this is an important uh, a uh, set of developments in the realm of, of perceptions, which of course in politics are, are, are reality. Uh, as for the connection between the jailbreak and um, that I described and um, uh, the attempt to broker a, normal, a normalized relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel, I think there is a connection. I think that Hamas fell, although I, I note that this military operation has been planned for two years, long before the effort to reconcile Saudi Arabia and Israel ever got underway. Uh, but I think uh, the Palestinians generally uh, have been um, motivated to remind the world that they exist, that they their problems can't be set aside. Uh, the Israeli government, with the connivance of the Biden administration, and before that, the Trump administration, was making an effort to turn to set the Palestinian side issue aside in order to produce Arab-Israeli normalization. And the Palestinians set out with this raid into Israel uh, to demonstrate that that is impossible, uh, that the only way that uh, you can have peace uh, in Palestine is with a two-state solution. And oddly enough, although, although Hamas, of course, started as a movement funded funded in part by the Israelis, by Mr. Netanyahu, who has openly admitted that 
he collaborated with Qatar to fund uh, the uh, Hamas in, in Gaza in order to split the divide the Palestinians between the Palestinian Authority, which is essentially the capos in a certain in the 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 the, the, the um, uh, uh, local camps. police enforcing enforcing the rules in West Bank uh, and and Gaza, which is uh, something quite different. Um, I, I think um, uh, Hamas uh, Hamas seized the moment uh, to uh, evoke Israel into doing exactly what Israel has predictably done. In order to make it clear to the world that you, you, you have to have a two-state solution, which was had become a talking point, there was no reality to it at all. There'd been no peace process for twenty some years. Um, now there must be. Um, and I think people have have recognized Hamas has succeeded. People have recognized that uh, the one-state solution, which some many favored, meaning a purely democratic one man, one vote uh, arrangement in Palestine, in which inevitably the Jewish population, given its higher level of culture and civilization and finance, would have uh, called most of the shots, um, that this is off the table. Uh, after all the hatred that has been demonstrated on both sides, uh, coexistence in one state is obviously impossible in Palestine. Two states, however, would give the Palestinians a stake in peace. They have no stake in peace at the moment. Uh, they're like a, like a rabbit being swallowed by some kind of boa constrictor. The, the, as time goes on, they go farther and farther down the throat of the snake, and they're crying out, and they were doing so at a pitch that apparently no one internationally could hear. And now, their cause has been dramatized. So um, I think um, uh, their motivations are very clear, and and they did have to do with halting uh, the um, uh, dismissal of their cause by, between the Saudis and the and the Israelis. Now I don't believe that the Saudis would, in fact, have done that. Uh, there are too many issues of great concern to ordinary people in Saudi Arabia, beginning with violations of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, halting those was one of Hamas's main uh, main objectives. Um, and um, But continuing uh, to, uh, to uh, ending the endless brutality by settlers against uh, Palestinians, which, by the way, is going on now uh, under cover of the operation in Gaza. Uh, things have never been worse. So... Uh, I don't think the Saudis uh, would have given up uh, in the form of a fully normalized relationship. But they obviously were prepared to do transactions and to treat Israel transactionally. The best evidence for that is that they invited the Israeli Minister of Tourism to come to Saudi Arabia. Why? Because in a dramatic departure from their previous isolation from the world, they are now trying to build a tourism industry. Very good for Swiss hotel managers, I should say. Um, and uh, they would love to have uh, well-heeled Israeli tourists come and spend their shekels in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think for the moment that is off the table. Uh, but uh, it was very much a reality prior to the October 7 uh, actions by Hamas. So these things are all connected, and you can separate one from another. And uh, we can't have a resolution of what is going on now uh, that takes the form of another expulsion of Palestinians, more tolerance of massacres, uh, the condoning of genocide. Um, and I think those in the West, including President Biden, who have been prepared to give Israel a pass on these issues, are beginning to pay heavily in terms of their political prestige in their domestic politics. The latest polls coming out show Mr. Biden has lost massively his support among American youth uh, and on this issue of his stance on Gaza. Uh, 
as well as, of course, the fact that today is his 81st birthday, which, as I approach 81, I appreciate um, in two senses. One, I'm happy for him, and second, I don't think he should be in charge. Well said. Um, Ambassador, though, like you were saying that a two-state solution is a must, but if we look back at the last 30 years, the Oslo process, it seems to me that oh, this was almost a scam. I think the only one who really believed in it was Isa Grabin. The others, I just don't see how, how this was ever taken serious, and Israel was never seriously pushed toward it. If you remember the, the, the horrible idea of of Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, of how to create a two-state solution, which was basically one state and one prison, completely guarded and fenced off from the rest and called that a state. How, do you think that it is realistic, also looking at the geography at the moment of Gaza and the West Bank, where the Palestinians still live, that an actual state, a geographical construct can emerge out of this? Is Do you, do you have any hope for that? I think there is reason to hope for it. Um, I recall that uh, after an extraordinarily bloody struggle in Algeria, one million French colonists went home. That was not uh, a pretty sight, uh, and it caused internal problems in France, of course. But, uh, you know, de Gaulle had the courage to end that, uh, that strife uh, with the removal of the colonies uh, that France had established, 20% of Algerians perished in that conflict, um, which still scars Algeria. And the Pied-Noir who returned to, to uh, France, uh, you know, were involved in the Lame Secret and other movements which were uh, very destabilizing to, the, to France. And so it's not easy, but the French example shows that it can be done. Um, I think the same is true of the British in Kenya after the Mau Mau movement. This settler colonialism invariably leads to some attempt at genocide. Um, that was the case in the United States, in Canada, in Australia. It wasn't the case in New Zealand because the Maoris were too tough. Uh, it wasn't the case in South Africa because the Zulus and other South African blacks were too tough. It wasn't the case in Kenya because eventually black Kenyans rose up in the Mau Mau movement, which was, uh, which was itself a horror. Um, but it did result in uh, a separation from uh, the colonial rule of the British. Same thing could happen. Now, um, the, uh, the, the difficulty of all this is, is obvious in terms of the fact that you've got a, an Israeli cabinet which is the most determined genocidal cabinet the world has ever seen. Um, and I don't excuse the Nazi cabinets uh, from that comparison. Um, the overt statements of genocidal intent are uh, unmistakable. There's no effort, as the Germans did make, uh, to conceal uh, what is in store for the Palestinians. Um, there's no, no fake... Um, camp for Jews, uh, set as an, like the one the Nazis set up uh, to bring the Swiss Red Cross in to show how wonderful they were treating um, the people they had taken uh, away from their homes. No effort whatsoever of that sort, uh, just bombing and strafing and murder on the ground. Um, uh, Israel appears to be paying quite a heavy price for that in terms of combat losses, but um, of course is not reporting accurately uh, what is what is happening. Meanwhile, uh, the front to the north, the Hezbollah front with, with northern Israel, is getting ever more dangerous. Um, I think Hezbollah has been quite cautious. Uh, Iran, its uh, backer, has made it quite clear it doesn't want a wider war. Um, but Hezbollah is signaling its support of Palestinians, of Hamas, and trying to provide a diversion, a detour, a distraction for Israeli forces, tying them down in the north. Um, so uh, I think the answer to the question is, um, 
Uh, yes, uh, there could be um, uh, a, a two-state solution. It would be very painful. Um, it would require uh, uh, most of the settlers in the West Bank and uh, to uh, retreat to Israel proper. Um, it would involve land swaps, probably. These have been talked about. Perhaps some settlements near the 1967 borders uh, could be retained in return for land uh, now in Israel that uh, would be given to Palestine. Um, whatever uh, came out would, of course, and, and this is something everybody seems to have forgotten, the United Nations passed the partition plan, uh, which uh, will very much favor Jewish immigration. Um, and I have to say in part because I think Europeans had a guilty conscience and wanted to get rid of the remaining Jews in Europe and give them a place to live. Um, so 57% uh, of Palestine was allocated to the Jewish state and the remainder to Palestine. Not content with that, Israel unilaterally declared independence and took uh, all but a, a, a smaller fraction of the, of the land. Um, so we're talking about you know, a Palestinian state that is in a fraction of a fraction of what the UN originally envisaged. Um, Hamas, as I started to say, but did not finish, um, and I should, uh, began um, with a position that uh, there could only be one state. It didn't say no Jews can live in Palestine, because, of course, historically Jews did live in Palestine, and no Muslim authority ever denied uh, Jews the right to live in Palestine. But it did demand a single state. That was then. Um, subsequently, Hamas has accepted the idea of a two-state solution, providing there is a referendum to validate it democratically on the Palestinian side. Um, and I think the Palestinians at this point would settle for a fraction of a fraction of what the United Nations originally allocated them. So the answer is, if there were a will, there would be a way. Uh, there is no will at present, but perhaps the horrors we are we are being uh, we're, we're witnessing will create the will where there has been none. 